Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the TT Recap webinar. Today's webinar is entitled The Resilient Society. Our speaker is Professor Markus Brunner-Meyer from Princeton University. Markus today will tell us about how to make our societies resilient. Resilience is a much different concept than robustness. Whereas robustness is the ability to resist, resilience is the ability to react, rebound, or mean revert after a shock. The ability to change and adapt is critical to building resilience. And resilience is vital for societal sustainability. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the hidden challenges of our societies. Resilience is then the new imperative for designing our post-pandemic communities, for ensuring that individuals, institutions, and nations can successfully face a globalized world filled with unknown risks. Lacking resilience, societies, families, and individuals can reach tipping points from which they cannot recover any longer. How we can then develop communities that are resilient to adverse shocks? Safety buffers, redundancies, protected areas, personal development, societal healing from inequality and discrimination, flexible institutions, improved interplay of governments, markets, social norms, and a global view are all necessary steps ahead. And without further ado, please let me introduce uh, our speaker. Markus Brunner-Meyer is the Edward St. Ford Professor in the Economics Department at Princeton University and Director of Princeton's Benheim Center for Finance. His research focuses on international financial markets and the macroeconomy with special emphasis on bubbles, liquidity, financial and monetary price stability, and digital money. In 2020, at the outbreak of COVID, he established a webinar series known as the Marcus Academy Series, involving contribution from leading academics and thinkers on critical issues facing the global economy. Marcus is also a no resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, a research associate at the NBR, the CEPR, says IFO, the Lu Han Academy, and a member of the Bellagio Group on the International Economy. He's a Sloan Research Fellow, Fellow of the Economic Society, Guggenheim Fellow, and a recipient of the Bernaiser Prize, granted for outstanding contribution in the third fields of macroeconomics and finance. He's a member of several advisory groups, including to the US Congressional Budget Office, the Bank for International Settlements, and the Bundesbank, as well as previously to the International Monetary Fund, the Federal Reserve of New York, European Systemic Risk Board. Marcus was awarded his PhD by the London School of Economics. He has been awarded several best paper prizes and served on the editorial boards of a number of leading economics and finance journals. He has worked to establish the concepts of liquidity spiral, COVR as a measure of systemic risk, the volatility paradox, paradox of prudence, European safe bonds, financial dominance, the redistributive monetary policy, the reversal rate, and digital currency areas. His recent book, The Resilient Society, won the prize for the 2021 Best Business Book in German and was listed among best economics books by the Financial Times. Many thanks again, Marcus, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Claudio. It's a pleasure to be with you. And thanks to the audience for coming and uh, listening to my presentation on the, the Resilient Society. It's based on the book uh, Claudio mentioned uh, before. And I would like to uh, you know, uh, go a little bit deeper. What is resilience and uh, what Claudio was alluding to and uh, initiated already. So I will talk a little bit about the concept of resilience. Uh, in this, what I do in this book, and I would like to discuss it with you, and I'm looking forward to your questions uh, later on. But I think it comes as no surprise that, you know, we will face more and more shocks. So then there's a recurring shock. So we have a health shock, a pandemic at the moment. We might we probably will have antibiotic assistance. We will have another financial crisis, cyber attacks, natural disasters, a lot of uncertainties with new technologies, but everything is moving much faster. And you know, often the crises don't come alone, they come in triplets and pairs. And so the question is how to handle this world 
And I would argue that resistance is futile. Uh, resilience might be helpful. And people talk a lot about resilience. And I would like to discuss it uh, in more detail and contrast it with robustness or how to avoiding simply risk on how does connect to the sustainability and other concepts uh, we uh, play around with. So the first thing I would like to do, contrast it with robustness. And robustness is about, as Claudia said, it's about withstanding, resisting a shock, being fault tolerant. So you block almost all known or unknown shocks, while resilience is you might be hit by a shock, but you bounce back because you react, you're flexible. And you know, I would like to draw a connection to the fable written by the French poet La Fontaine in the 17th century, where he compares the oak and the reed. The oak is very rigid and stands in the wind. It doesn't move much. But if the wind becomes a hurricane, then it falls over and the tipping point occurs, goes beyond the tipping point and breaks over and can't come back. So there's a robustness barrier. Robustness means very rigid standing there. But when you hit the robustness barrier, the tipping point, it, you break and then you come back. While the reed seems very volatile and seems very weak, but it always bounces back. And in this fable where the reed and the, and the oak talk to each other, the oak looks mighty and all this, and the reed looks weak. But at ultimately, the reed stands back up after the hurricane again and tells the oak, I bend, I bow, but I do not break. And that's related to this volatility paradox I uh, worked early on, where it's okay, actually having some. Uh, volatility issues uh, where you know something looks weak and is constantly volatile moving around is not clear that this is actually less uh, stable than something which you know it looks very very low volatility but ultimately might break if a strong hurricane comes and the other thing is between robustness and resilience you need different forms of redundancies for robustness you need a lot of buffers for each particular shock while for resilience, you need fewer redundancies, but more flexible redundancies. So you have reserve units somewhere. And if the shock comes, you might, you might be hit because you have to adjust the reserve units to, for this particular shock, and then you bounce back. While for robustness to really withstand any type of shock, you actually have to have, for each type of shock, a different you know, redundancy uh, hangout. Now, you might argue that, oh, isn't disconnected to the economic debate about rules versus discretion and rules is you know rigidity and standing to firm and discretion is the flexibility and short termism but i would argue you know it's a different debate rules versus discretion it also could be that rules are more contingent so you need rules which are more um, contingent and also actually it's important to have rules to commit Otherwise, if you have only flexibility, but then you're not credible. You can actually not convince the population to do certain things. So you need certain rules in order to credibly commit to some certain actions. And that's very important. So that's the difference between robustness and resilience. So resilience is a different concept. And uh, that's why uh, one has to you be very clear. And I would say resilience comes with fewer redundancies more risk, but when you bounce back, it's not, um, the risk is not so dangerous. Now, the other thing is to say, you know, we live in a society where we would like to avoid any type of risk. And, and risk avoidance or risk management is mostly about, is a static concept, it's about the variance, the value at risk, or if you're more systemic, you think about COVAR, where, you know, the spillover risk from one institution to another institution. While resilience, is a dynamic concept, it's over time. It's about mean reversion. So if you have a stochastic process, it's about a mean reversion parameter, not the loading on, on the sigma on the volatility. So it's about bouncing back and here have an impulse response curve, you know, you fall down and then it bounces back. So how quickly do you bounce back? And that's what the resilience is. So it's, it's different from that too. And the main message of the book is, you know, we should not look at risk, we should look at resilience. There are certain risks which have no resilience, they are dangerous. But if there's some risk with resilience, they're less worrisome. And so the distinction should not be only, is it risky or is it not risky? The question is much more, is the risk associated with non-resilience? And if it's risky, but with resilience, and we can foster the resilience, then it's less problematic.
So let me just show you a resilient path. So I have here a dotted line. So the dotted line here is, is not risky at all. That's the mean, but here, this is um, uh, risky, but resilient. So whenever there is something going down, you bounce back, it goes down, it bounces back and so forth. So it's risky, but uh, resilient. Now, if I, I can choose this dash line, the less risky part, so that's totally risk less, but you see in the long run, I will be much worse off. So it's actually going for the more risky part, it actually has a higher expected growth rate, this little dotted line, uh, but in the long run, actually, I will be much better off for going for the risky as long as it's resilient. So what I have to watch out is, is it really resilient or not, not whether it's risky or not. Okay, and that's, I think, what I want to have a mind shift away from risk focus, more the resilience focus. Now, what are these resilience destroyers? So then once we know, you have to focus more whether some risks are resilient or not resilient. We have to see what are the resilience destroyers or resilience killers. And essentially there are three of them and they're related to the first one are traps, then the feedbacks and tipping points. So what's a trap? So if I have a trap and I'm shocked I'm trapped and I can't bounce back. So it's essentially not being able to bounce back. So here I've depicted here, you follow the same path as before, but now I have a trap here. So I'm, I'm caught and then I can't come back. So that destroys my resilience and then risk is really dangerous. So because it has no resilience attached to that. So another one is where I have, oops, let me see, I have tipping points where the tipping points at once I hit this tipping point, things get even worse. So tipping points are even worse than traps. A trap is if I hit a trap and then I can't bounce back, but at least I stay there at the trap, middle income trap, poverty trap, liquidity trap. We have a lot of traps in economics and also in the society, but tipping points are even worse. You actually, you hit the tipping point and then the whole thing spirals out of control because you get into feedback loops. So that's where the feedback loops come into play and spirals and things like that. There's a bifurcation. If you're above this line, you, you can come back. If you're below the line, you actually the whole thing spirals out of control. And that's essentially much more difficult uh, to handle. So should you avoid any risk if uh, you know there's some tipping points and what's the connection between tipping points and, and uh, risk taking? Let me show you, it's not so simple. Sometimes you can escape a tipping point by taking risk. So seemingly riskless part with an adverse trend is actually more dangerous. So here, I've, again, the choice, I flipped the growth rate a little bit. So here I have my dashed line that seems riskless. And here I have my resilient path, which is now a lower growth rate. So both of them have lower growth rates. But what you see in this dashed line if it goes downhill all the time a little bit, but steadily, it has no risk attached to it. But once you hit the tipping point, it gets out of control, or spirals out of control. But if I go for the resilient part, risky but resilient part, I might escape this tipping point and then I don't hit this tipping point. So it's not the case that I should avoid, whenever there's a tipping point, I should avoid any risk. Sometimes it's actually, taking a little bit of risk with a tipping point, I might escape the tipping point. So I have to take this risk. And if you think about, you know, taking R&D risk in the environment, so in order to avoid these tipping points we have in the environment, the Gulfstream stops or whatever, the permafrost and the Antarctic stops. So things, these are tipping points. And to avoid them, we probably have to take some risks, some, you know, new innovations in order to avoid these dangers. Now, how do you follow such a strategy, a strategy, a resilient strategy? And the book this dedicates a huge uh, thing to that. One is, you know, you take on risk if it has uh, some resilience to it. And the resilience, you can work on it to make the system more resilient. So it's essentially like uh, you have a plan B and the plan B will help you to come back. So there's a crisis modus and there are two parallel strategies. One is, what we typically do, we want to contain the crisis. So you contain, make the impact of the crisis smaller. But the second thing is you want to bounce back potentially to the new normal, to potentially to an uh, even better normal to avoid the straps and feedbacks and tipping points. And that's, you have to do things, both things 
simultaneously. If you think about the COVID crisis, there's all these containment measures we did, but in parallel, we developed also vaccines. The vaccines were our hope to bounce back to the normal, the old normal or potentially new normal again. So instead of avoiding crisis, you take on the take on risk only if you have this good plan B. But in general, what you have as a policymakers, you have also a communication strategy to convince your people to, to do that. And you know, people typically have a tough time to figure out what is a counterfactual. So, and that makes developing a resilience strategy very challenging. So what I have depicted here is uh, you know, from the year 2020, uh, you see across the weeks, the death rate, uh, in, uh, the weekly death rates in Germany and you see the max and minimum band from 2006 to 2019. And when you see the 2020 death, it actually is not higher than, than the, uh, the brown line here, but then there's this range. So you could only see at the end of the year of 2020, you could see actually there is the death rate is exceeding previous spans of potential death rates. And that's essentially what made it very difficult to convince part of the population that there's a serious problem there because of all the measures, you kept the death rate down and then people say, oh, look, the death rate is not so high compared to what it was in historically. So a resilience strategy in the some sense, if you hit by a crisis and then bounce back is actually to some extent more easily to communicate because everybody sees that you're hit by a crisis and bounce back. So have a robust strategy where you never see being hit by a crisis in the first place because you put a lot of resources there in order to even hit the first impact uh, to hide the first impact, it makes it harder to communicate. So in this sense, a resilience strategy is a little bit easier to, uh, to communicate to uh, the real world or to the people who might be skeptical that there's a problem in the first place. Now, then you can also ask, how is resilience related to sustainability? We talked about tipping points and things like that. So environmental, so sustainability is always an environmental concept as well. And Sustainability is actually more than resilience. So actually being not resilient, then it's not sustainable. So if you spell out of control, things are not sustainable. But resilience requires more. So resilience alone is not enough to get sustainability. For this, you also need no adverse trend. So for example, what I've depicted here is a resilient path, but it goes downhill, so it's not sustainable. So you need two things, resilience and no adverse trend in order to have some sustainable uh, environment or economy, whatever the system uh, or society you live on. Then there is the other thing is, so when is a society more resilient? And it depends on the speed of change. There's a, there's a horse race, so the, um, a slow shock, it's a sequence of small shocks. You can react in time and bounce back more easily. If you have rapid shocks or jumps, the reaction time is too slow to really turn around very quickly. And there's a race between the speed of the shock and the speed of the reaction time. And we live in a world where everything becomes faster and faster. Of course, we also become faster in reacting to shocks. Uh, and the question is, you know, what is becoming fast, more fast or more faster, the, the shock itself or the reaction time? So we have to make sure that we are flexible enough that we keep up the speed of reacting to the speed of the shocks. Of course, it's a, it's a rat race uh, we are in, in this regard. So that's about resilience and the speed of change. The other question, it's a little bit more speculative and I want to throw out something uh, new at you, which is not in the book, which is related to spontaneous order or self-organizations a la Hayek. So when we talk about spontaneous order, so you can have certain systems which are designed, you know, by a central planner designs some system or some market design or, you know, whatever the design is, or it can be some spontaneous order. And the classic uh, example Hayek used always is language. Now, the language is not designed by central authority. It evolves and is essentially uh, an, a, a spontaneous order, uh, which is, you know, self-organized. And uh, of course, we have some artificial languages like Esperanto, uh, which are uh, organized, self, uh, they are uh, designed while the spontaneous. And the question is, which of them is, is more resilient if you hit some system, a spontaneous order by a shock uh, compared to a market design? And uh, 
The argument is here, I would like to speculate a little bit by saying, oh, if something is more centrally designed, then you typically we design it without keeping all potential shocks in mind. Uh, it might be more uh, susceptible to shocks while a spontaneous order evolves as a part of a process over you know, many, many years, it is exposed to various shocks and hence will be more resilient than, um, than a design. Because when you design things, you cannot imagine all the potential shocks you might be facing. Now, that's you know, one thing. Then you can also think about resilience in a more fashion with a dynamic trade-off. So it's a term structure of resilience. So what I want to say with that is that it's a different aspect of resilience. There is short-term resilience and there is more long-term resilience. And so let me show this. So it, it could be that you, know, you run an economy in such a way, when you hit, you will bounce back very quickly, but it makes you more vulnerable to another shock down the road. Okay, so for example, um, there is a shock and then you hugely stimulate uh, and run up the debt level significantly. And, but then if, if there comes another shock, then you have this high debt level and you're more vulnerable to the next shock. So you have more resilience left. So your resilience is like a capital stock. You can spend some of it. And if you spend too much, you bounce back more quickly in the first shock, but you have less redundancies left for the subsequent shocks. So there's a term structure trade-off. We have to keep this in, in, in mind. And that's, you know, we can't spend all of that. Now, the way the book classifies different resilience, resilience can be applied at, at various different levels. It cannot be applied at individual level. It can be applied at a system level, and it can be applied at the society level. And society can also be, can be a village, can be a town, can be, you know, a country, a nation, or a whole, the whole globe. These are all different societies. So resilience at the individual level, the book is not this, so, talking much, but there are many books in psychology on this, on personal well-being, mental health, how it can make yourself more resilient. In terms of resilience of net systems, you can think of networks, how is the electric grid more or less resilient? How is the interbank market more or less resilient or global value chains? And for this, you know, you can think of systemic risk to spillovers and domino effects and uh, systemic risk measures I've worked on earlier. But what's interesting about the society being resilient, the resilience of the society depends all about interaction, how people behave and people react to things. And I, I illustrate this on the, in this, uh, the endogenous response of others really matter. And when we think about society, it's, it, we think a lot about externalities. I do something, cause a negative externality on you. And economics, you know, teaching is full of externalities, but I think what's really important is to combine it with uh, strategic complementarities. Okay, so let me explain you what I mean by that. So I think of two people, person A and person B, it could be two institutions or two countries, whatever we want, or could be many of them. And so the first person acts and causes a negative externality on person B, and person B suffers. And that's, you know, if this were all, that's fine. I mean, that's already bad enough. But now person B reacts, okay? That's where the strategic complementarity comes in. If person A does more of this, person B will also do more of that. So the person B reacts and that causes a spill back to person A and then the person A suffers. Because person A suffers, it, he will react as well and causes a bigger externality on person B. And then person B, you know, because of strategic complementarities, is doing even more so. So you then you spiral in a much worse situation. So it's not only the initial externality, it's just the amplification through the strategic complementarities of the externality that makes these feedback loops so dangerous, which comes into society. And this can be, you know, fire cell externalities. Well, fire cell externality is fine. It's, it's an externality, but if you combine it with a strategic complementarity, then the whole thing gets uh, much more dramatic. Or you know, another thing is just hoarding. You know? Person A buys toilet paper, 
there's less toilet paper for person B, person B starts buying hoarding toilet paper too. Then there's even less than A, and A is an even strong incentive to buy toilet paper. So that's just a simple trivial example. And I call this in the book, uh, these externalities, which are combined with strategic ex complementarities, I call them feedback externalities. And I think these are the dangerous ones uh, to look out for in order to make this society more resilient. I mean, you need some mechanism to avoid essentially these feedback externalities. We need mechanisms to avoid any externalities, but the feedback externalities uh, in particular. <clears throat> now, the book goes a little bit, when you go into society, you know, what is our social contract? We live, how should we live together as a society? And this is about rethinking capitalism, uh, uh, some webinar, so I want to go into this a little bit. And of course, there are the big thinkers, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Shoshana Crusoe, and so forth. And I give a very much an economics interpretation, an externality focused interpretation of the social contract. So the social contract is there to limit externalities. In particular, these feedback externalities, which are the really dangerous ones. So in these externalities, the social contract limits externalities. So we have certain laws or social norms or whatever to contain that somebody can cause an externality on somebody else, a negative externality. And the externality can come from somebody else. That's the typical externalities we have in mind. Or it can also come from mother nature. We just call them differently. Uh, we call them shocks, but I view them as externalities from mother nature. Mother nature generates an earthquake and cause a lot of pain on all many, many citizens. Essentially, that's also an externality. And how to make this society more resilient against that, you can do ex ante investments to make each individual more resilient so each individual can bounce back more easily. So that's one way to do it. Or it can actually, once the shock hit, we can actually support each other uh, to make, you know, in an exposed fashion after the shock. Um, and resilience has a different focus than just, uh, you know, simple insurance. Resilience would mean, you know, I help people to fall, come back to their feet, not necessarily only by, you know, providing financial support, but also other support, societal support, uh, reskilling support. So rather than paying purely unemployment benefits, you help people to get retrained to the new environment once the shock is hitting. And uh, that's what resilience is really emphasizing on. And, you know, it, and insurance is also part of it, but it's not all of it. And it's John Rawls essentially comes in behind the wheel of ignorance. From an ex-ante perspective, you would like to have a social contract such that exposed of the shock has occurred, the, the winners uh, pay to the losers. And then ex-ante, everybody will be better off because we can ensure each other against this idiosyncratic risk. And then the question is, um, you know, which societies can do this? Can this more diverse societies or more homogeneous societies? And there's actually an interesting trade-off as well. So if you have a society which is very heterogeneous, but then whenever there's a shock, it will hit people differently. Some will be winners, some will be losers, and then you can actually provide nice insurance. If you have a very homogeneous society, if everybody's the same, but then actually everybody's hit the same way and there's no winners, no losers. There are only losers or only winners. So you cannot really insure the insurance mechanism doesn't work. So that argues for a very diverse society where we have you know, a lot of heterogeneity in society. And you know, even the industries are focused on heterogeneity in the industry, not every, the whole country is focusing on one industry and things like that. So that's one thing. But the other thing we note from work by Alberto Alessinas and uh, Alessina and others that uh, diverse society are less willing to insure each other. Okay, so even though they are more able to insure each other because they are more hit by idiosyncratic shocks rather than systematic shocks, they are less willing to insure each other. While uh, homogeneous societies are more willing to insure each other, but they have not so much heterogeneity, not so much idiosyncratic risk to help out insurance. That's a dilemma that we are facing. There's an optimal degree of uh, heterogeneity uh, to capture that. Now, how do you implement the social contract? So if you have, you know, in our society a social contract, how do you implement it? And when we do economics, we always focus on you know, government versus markets, okay? 
But I would argue that one element which is not as much emphasis as it should be, social norms are probably even more important than governments and markets. And so it's essentially you have to find a spot in this triangle. Governments can implement it. Governments can you know, internalize externalities. They can change the rules and force it. You have a surveillance government. Uh, and, and markets are more creative and innovative in order to develop new vaccines and so forth. But social norms are really important. And just to see that, so what I showed here is the difference between Japan and Germany you see the stringency index of the COVID implementation and compare, this is the German one, and that's uh, the, the Japanese one. You see the German one is way more stringent. The, all the policy measures are way more stringent. The government was enforcing way more uh, compared to the Japanese one. But nevertheless, if you look at the number of COVID cases, it's actually much lower, well, much lower in Japan. So I have to update this figure, of course, because now, in both countries, it explodes, but I can show you and assure you that uh, you know German cases are always on top of the Japanese cases. And why is that? Because in Japan, there's a social norms that you wear a face mask. There's no debate about that. It, you don't have a government, or you don't need a government enforcing it because your neighbor is enforcing it on you. And so there's a social understanding that the social norms are very, very important to have implemented a social contract to internalize externalities. Uh, in a better way. So this is often totally emphasized, underemphasized in, uh, in our societies. Now what the book does, it goes through a lot of different, uh, different policies. And I'll let me just highlight a few, given a high level overview. And then I might zoom in on one particular aspect, uh, one particular area of policies. And so the, the, the first, second part, the first part is about this conceptual, aspects I just talked about. The second part is about health uh, thing. And I mentioned already, you have to run these parallel strategies. And one of the, the, the second strategy, so one is containment. So there are different elements of the containment strategy component. And then there's this other component, second uh, element where you have to develop a strategy, how to bounce back. Don't you know, just containing it and also bouncing back. And that's like, if you run a zero COVID strategy, like in China, you don't, you just focus on the containment, but then you're stuck and you can't come back. So for resilience, the coming back aspect, and that's where the vaccine played an important role. It was the important element. Now, what's about the macroeconomy? Uh, the macroeconomy, what you see, where does the resilience come from? How can you policymakers or governments create more resilience in our society? And we have a very low real interest rate. And the low interest rate gives us more fiscal space. It gives us more room. And governments freely exploited this efficient room, probably too much, uh, that you, know, you can bounce back. But if you have a low interest rate, you're also closer to a zero lower bound or effective lower bound. And that means you have less room for monetary policy. There's way more room for fiscal policy, low interest rate, so more resilience coming from the fiscal side but less room for monetary policy. You shouldn't rely too much on the central banks. Now, that's for the macro. There's a whole chapter dedicated to fiscal, whole chapter dedicated to monetary, and also the inflation whipsaw, as I describe it. Is, you know, the inflation was going down, and now it's bouncing back like a whipsaw, uh, making it more dramatic. What's about finance? Why is the resilience in finance? So in finance, resilience often comes from debt restructuring. If you have a debt, debt overhang problem, debt, that prevents you from bouncing back. Think about Japan. Uh, you have a lot of zombie firms. They have a high debt level. They don't invest any much, so much anymore. So there's no bouncing back from that. So debt and efficient insolvency law, private bankruptcy law, law firms bankruptcy law, for sovereign debt, international sovereign debt restructuring mechanisms, that's actually, which would actually lead to more resilience because you know, if people get into difficulties, you can restructure your debt and this way you can bounce back. Otherwise you cannot bounce back. Now more generally, um, you can link debt versus equity to my read and the oak. Okay, so what, what I want to say about that is that let's suppose you know, might be all familiar with this. There's the tax revenue, 
is on the x-axis. So there's a negative shock, you have very low tax revenue, and then there's a high uh, boom phase, and then there's high tax revenue. And uh, it could be also a cash flow for company. It applies the same for a country, it would be tax revenue, for a company it would be the cash flow of the company or whatever entity you want to know. And then you have a debt contract. If you owe, so you have to pay the same face value of the debt you promised, except if you go bankrupt, then you pay less. And there might be even some bankruptcy costs. So that's why we know 45 degree line. If you promise some equity claims, so if you're a company and promise some equity claims, so you can essentially, whenever you do well, the equity value goes up. Whenever you're poorly, the equity value goes down. So the equity claim goes up and down, as you can see here. And, and if you have a debt claim, so if you debt issue as a company, if you issue corporate debt, you have essentially a, close, a flat phase value, except if you go bankrupt, then there's this jump down. And then on top of it, you have this runs. So it seems if you have a society or an economy run on equity, it is very volatile. It constantly moves around. Okay. But it's, it's like this read. But if you have a society which is very much driven on loans and debt and, and things like that, it's a little bit like the oak because nothing happens. If you move around this, it looks like very, very stable. The value of the debt is not moving much, except if you hit the bankruptcy point or the tipping point, like the oak falling over and then it can't come back up depending on the re debt restructuring mechanism. So there's an analogy that equity is more like the reed and debt is more like um, the oak. And you would like to move to a system which is more equity driven, where the risk is more equally spread across the society, not concentrated because that leads to this concentration of, uh, of risks. Now, of course, the other things which make finance more resilient, you know, you can have some distributed technology and other, you know, uh, measures to make the society more resilient. Then there's a chapter on inequality. So inequality essentially uh, talks um, about either income inequality or wealth inequality. So income means people have uh, different incomes and and wealth is just if you know some people are wealthy, they have inherited a lot of wealth, or they have had past income was very high, so they accumulated a high wealth over time. So one is more flow, the income, and, and wealth is more stock. Uh, that's, I introduce a new concept which I call resilience inequality. And think of two people, two persons, person A and person B, they have the same income, the same wealth right now. But the uh, they have different resilience. So person A, if he's hit by a shock, he can bounce back. If person B, if he's hit by a shock, he's trapped and he can't bounce back. And so if you have uh, two people the same way, but they're different in resilience, they will be different in the long run because person A can take opportunities which are associated with risks. He knows he will bounce back. So he will take opportunities and take advantage of these opportunities and become uh, get a higher income and hence ultimately become wealthier than person B, who is actually not able to take this risk because you know if he takes this risk, he will be trapped in it and he will be in a bad situation. And so this resilient inequality might actually be the initial driver why we see such big difference in income inequality and in wealth inequality. At least there are some dynamics are going on. And then there's a whole part of the book which deals with very international. So the COVID crisis was a very global crisis. And the emerging economies, what's special about emerging economies? And you know, in particular, it also talks about uh, poverty traps and middle income traps. So once, essentially, if you're in a poverty trap, you can't come out. And knowing that you might be trapped in a poverty trap, you cannot take any risks either. So that's related to resilience inequality. And the middle income trap is for whole countries uh, when countries, you know, catch up with the frontier technologies by copying uh, the frontier technologies. And once you're at the frontier, you have to switch and have to become innovative. And it's very difficult for many countries to make the switch away from the middle income trap. Then on top of it, there's the whole international macro finance. Typically we argue that flexible exchange rates are a way of resilience. Now, if you're hit by a shock, you depreciate your exchange rate 
your export sector becomes more competitive in the global market, and it helps you to grow out of this problem, Phoenix Miracle and other phenomena. That's resilience. It gives you resilience as long as your debt is not denominated in foreign currency. If your debt is mostly denominated in the domestic currency, you can play with your exchange rate to bounce back and have some resilience. Um, it, the book also talks about the global role of the dollar as a safe asset and other things. It talks about global value chains. We have, we have to move away from a just in time uh, uh, structure where it's not much resilience to a just in case structure, we might want to have stress tests on global value chains in order to get more resilience. Uh, in, uh, and this, these are some resilience lessons. Stress test was introduced after the global financial crisis on financial institutions, but we might want to do it also for, uh, for global value chains, or even at least recommended to certain industries to do that. That could be done on the private sector uh, for industries. And then there's a whole part of the book which deals with global geopolitics. Uh, again, many aspects, you know, China, uh, US uh, rivalry, uh, what does Europe position itself? What options does Europe have? And then at the end, there's also a chapter, a whole chapter on climate change, where the sustainability concept is really in the connection to resilience is worked out of many other, you know, interesting aspects uh, showing up there. So let me uh, conclude with uh, just an outline of the book and then we can go to Q&A. Uh, so as I said, the first part of the book is what I said initially, society and resilience, the different concepts connecting to resilience. Then the second part of the book is about the four elements of resilience management. Um, there are outlined four elements that are two main sub-strategies. One is the containment. And the other one is the bouncing back, the plan B of bouncing back. But the first one has actually has three elements to it uh, combine. And, and one important component of this containment is all the communication. So there's a whole chapter dedicated how to communicate that. And then part three uh, goes into you know, the COVID aspects. Would it lead to an innovation boost? And we have seen a lot of innovation boosts like there's working from home totally different if all the stigmas are now broken we can work from home it will work very differently but we have also seen working 100 from home doesn't work either telemedicine so now it's way more common that if you have some uh, problems you can just call up your doctor through a zoom call and get some advice get some prescriptions not all the time you have to go to the doctor in the first place so a lot of social stigmas were removed or regulatory hurdles were removed. That leads to an innovation boost. Uh, we haven't, you've only seen the beginning of that. But it also led to some scarring. So it leads to scarring in terms of that people get more scared. So the difference in beliefs, people become more risk averse, they're more worried now. That's some belief scarring. But they're also scarring on firm size, they're overly indebted, there's a debt hang problem. So there are many different forms of scarring uh, the book discusses. And I mentioned already this uh, financial whipsaw uh, where you saw in March 2020 uh, almost collapse of the financial sector. And then it bounced back very radically. And you know, the market was bouncing so strongly that you know, we have now excessive high asset prices and we have the issues of corporate bonds went through the roof. So way more issues of corporate bonds than in the previous years. And of course, we have also a lot of public debt now. We have an inflation whipsaw in March 2020. Deflation was shining through, and then we bounce back very quickly. And finally, uh, part four is then about the global resilience, the emerging market, developing economies, uh, geopolitics, world order, and the global finance and value chains. And uh, so rather than going in with all the details, I think I used up my 45 minutes. So we have some time. It's probably better to have some back and forth and some uh, Q&A uh, that uh, thanks again for your interest and I very much appreciate it.